This story is of a great sinner that found home in the arms of Jesus. So I hope that somebody else is going to hear that no matter what our sins, no matter how deep we have fallen, there is a God holding up his arms and saying, there's a very short road to me. You make the first step and I will finish running towards you and embrace you. So I pray that this story is not going to be about Kalina Berman Scores. It's only going to be about God's way, how he leads every one of us. Uh, I was born in the beautiful mountains in the Carpathian Ukraine. And as a child, the life was wonderful. I was the youngest of uh, four people. Uh, it was a wonderful life. We had a river behind our house, and life just was idyllic for us. Now, my parents were, unbeknownst to us, in the um, uh, underground, Ukrainian underground fighting the Russian forces who were uh, had already conquered most of Ukraine, but they had not conquered the Carpathian Mountains yet. And one evening in September, I remember my parents arriving. We were surprised. They had their military clothing on, and they had their weapons with them in their hands. And it was rush, 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 putting clothing on us. They put about three sets of clothing on our bodies. And uh, we had to leave, and we're crying. I was um, about five years old. That was in 1939. Uh, then I was watching my father, whom I loved dearly, walking outside, and he had a little box in his hands. I trotted behind him. I saw him kneel down on the ground and take some earth and put the earth in the little box. And my father was a very manly gentleman, and I've never seen him cry before. And as I looked, I see tears running down his face. So I said, Tatko, which is Ukrainian for dad, Tatko, why are you crying? And he said, Kalinochka, which is a diminutive for my name, Kalinochka, I'm putting some earth here because I know I'm going to die in a foreign land. So I want you children to take this ground and sprue it on my, on my uh, uh, mohila, which is on my grave, so that I know that at least I have some Ukrainian ground in my grave. And so that is how it began. We had to leave immediately that same night. We were traveling all through the night, always on the railroad to be sure that we don't get off the ground. At night, uh, we traveled during the day. We were accommodated by other underground people in, in barns, which would cover us with straw so that nobody could find us. And at night, we would travel again. And this went on for about a month until we crossed into the Yugoslavian country. And uh, again, because of the wonderful uh, net of underground people that worked with my father. So we arrived there, but unfortunately, shortly afterwards, we were taken into labor camps in Germany. And so life was very difficult for us. My sister and I got lost from my parents, and we ended up in an orphanage in Czechoslovakia. In a, uh, close to Prague, there is a small town called Modrzany. And uh, uh, it was an orphanage that actually my father had originally helped to organize. And that was for Ukrainian uh, children, for Ukrainian orphanages, annexed to a Ukrainian high school or gymnasium, as you would call it. And so there we are, were, not knowing where our parents were, uh, hungry. Um, we were sleeping on straw mattresses with our covering was old cots, army cots, uh, coats that were had too many holes to be worn by the army, so we would have it. My sister, who was two and a half years older than I am, we always had ear aches, and at night we would just blow hot air into each other's ear to alleviate the pain, then the other one would turn around. And this is how we survived our time in uh, the orphanage. And then three years later, of course, we were crying so frequently, mom too, mom too, for our mother. Why would this happen? Uh, my mom used to tell us about that we have angels, but we said we don't see the angels now. The angels are not helping us. Our tummies are hungry. We have nothing to eat. And so both my sister and I went through a very traumatic time. 
And then one day, a lady comes to the uh, office of uh, the orphanage, and I look at her. The face looked familiar, and she says, I'm your mom. I looked at it. I turn around, I ran and ran and ran, and I remember finally, I was always very small. I'm only five foot two, well, less than five foot two now. And I f remember falling into the grass. I couldn't run anymore, and I just cried. I said, where was this lady? Where was she? Why wasn't she with me all these years? For me now to have mom, so somehow, in my perverted understanding of life, I thought that, Somehow my mother didn't care where we were, which of course I know is wrong. So we were taken to Germany, where my parents were in forced labor. Somehow my parents found out where we were. So they were taken to forced labor, and there we were. They had two additional boys that were born. So I'm seven, my sister's eight, almost nine, and we were really taking care of our two boys because my mother was also taken into forced labor to a factory that manufactured buttons for military outfits. So she was gone all day. And here at our age, we're taking care of one boy that's one and a half and another one two and a half. Uh, so that was very difficult, no schooling. However, even with the uh, hardships that we had, my father being very, very mindful that we should have an education. I often say that life robbed me of formal education, but God gave me a father who was very mindful of education. I don't know how he did it, but somehow he would find books on art, he would find books on different languages, he would find teachers that would come to our barracks, and one teacher I remember was teaching us French, another teacher was teaching us art, another teacher was teaching us German, and so this is really the education that we received from uh, home schooled during the time that the bombs were falling left and right. And so at that time, uh, we were in Hanover, but my father, the German government, found out that he was a sculptor and was very providential. And as they found out that they needed a sculptor with his experience to build the backgrounds for German films. They had a lot of political films with, um, uh, which were filmed in Berlin. And so my father was asked to take over building the sculpturing around the uh, background of these films, which that improved my life very much because before the my father, as I saw him come home, he had his shoes had no soles anymore. So I remember watching through my bunk bed because we had beds like the soldiers have three and four tier. And I would look down and my dad would take ragged newspapers and wrap his shoes around it, take a string and or sort of tie the string around the newspapers and tie it. His hands, his artist hands were bloody full of calluses and was a horror time for him but somehow God found a way to alleviate that so we moved to Berlin in one way it was a blessing another way it was really not because we were still kept in a camp labor camp except that my father could out, go out into the studios and build the um, uh, background of it but uh, with all the bombs falling down we were bombed five times at one time uh, we were on the third floor. It was a Sunday. For some reason, my mom had locked the door when she left out for a few minutes. And all of a sudden, I hear the sound of alarm. Now, during the war, there were three type of sounds that to warn the population about the enemy coming, flying in to throw bombs on us. The first one was sort of a long, long sound. Ooh kind of long. The next one, as closer the airplanes came, it would accelerate, would, ooh. Well, we thought, okay, it's close. We better get out and go into the bunker. And the last one would be, ooh, just like the siren we hear from the um, medical vehicles. We knew, you had to just, that's your last chance. You have to go out. I took my two little brothers, I was alone with them. Again, they're two and four years old, and I'm eight. 
And so I tried to go to the door. The door is locked. And what am I going to do? I hear the bombs falling. So I took my boys, I wrapped them around myself and, and sitting in a corner. My father always said, if bombs fall, sit in the corner because the corner of a building can protect you better. And so here I'm holding my brothers all of a sudden, ba-boom. And I look, I could probably see a little bit further than that door. The building was just raised down. And our corner where I'm sitting there is still there. So obviously as a child, I was crying and holding on to them. Fortunately then people climbed up and rescued us. So these are some, this happened five times to us. So every time we bombed out, we lost everything. The only thing we had is what we had on our body. And that was until 1944. Now, since my father was a sculptor, at the end they closed the studio and they gave him a, a pile of Deutsche Reichsmark, that's the German marks, but it was nothing to buy. And so he had the money, was really couldn't do much with it. And at that time, we were very close to an area where the Russian army was coming. And my parents were extremely worried that we will be in the Russian that the, when the Russians come, that they will find my father because he was wanted by the government since he was the leader of the underground in the Carpathian Mountains. So my father took the bunch of this, of this German money. He went to the train station and he said to the, the train manager, he said, look, my father, bless his heart. My mother was very gifted for languages, not my father. So he just said, you take, you take money. You stopped the train at midnight. There was one last train was coming through that my father found out would, could be stopped in the village we were. You stopped the train, you take the money. And true enough, the gentleman did do that. My father, I, at midnight, he packed us up in a sleigh. Now my mother was hurt during one bombardment, so her hip was hurt. So he was, she was kind of handicapped in walking. And so here my father harnessed the, uh, the sleigh around his neck. He is pulling the sleigh, this is now November 44, in order to get to the train station. And we had to be very quiet. And so I'm holding one brother, my sister holding another brother. My mother is holding on to the sleigh and we made it to the train station. We got into the inside, it was a cattle train actually. It was not a passenger train. And as we walked in, there were already people laying on the ground, blankets and so forth. And my father, bless his heart, it was snowing. So he brought, you know, in a foresight, he brought a very warm blanket that we still had from Ukraine. So as he laid us down, bedded us down, he covered us up with a blanket. At night he would get up a few times, shake off the snow from the blanket. But it was very sad because some people there were they lost their mind, actually. And here my sister and I huddling together and we hear people crying and screaming and we saw that it was already, th their mind was gone because they couldn't quite cope with what was happening. So my sister and I decided, two little girls, we, we just had to get away from there during the day as the train was going. You keep in mind, the train only could go a few kilometers and then the rail was already damaged. So the few men that were on the train would go and try to primitively repair it so that the train could go on. Well, my sister and I being kind of bored with all of this. And so we hopped from between one train and another as it was going. And on one train, we see a young mother. She's sitting on her suitcase and she's holding a tiny baby in her arms. And we looked at her and she was cold. And she looked at us holding her baby. She was very lightly dressed. So my sister took her coat. As I mentioned to you, we had three, four layers of clothing that our parents put on us because we had no suitcases how we could transport it. So my sister took off her coat. She put it, wrapped it around the uh, young mother. And we continued hopping until we got to the last train. And, it was time to get back to our train, which was quite in the beginning. And as we stopped on that train where we saw this young mother, we looked, she was slumped down. And my sister looked at her and she says, Kalinuchka, I see she's not breathing. 
So she froze to death. And the baby was still in her arms. And the baby was frozen too. So that was a very traumatic thing for my sister and I to see how cruel the world was. So we told our parents about it. My father somehow, at the next stop, he somehow provided that her remains would be uh, adequately handled. And on this train we got, what my father wanted is to get the furthest away from the Russian approach. We, they were already about four kilometers away from us, for we heard the, the cannons and so forth to take. So we ended up in a uh, German town called Füssen, which is in Bavaria, and uh, got off the train. Uh, we were placed in a, um, um, a, a, a restaurant, but they had a banquet hall on the second floor. So they, in the blanket hall, there were mattresses, straw mattresses put down, was completely filled. And my father always loved to help other people. So in between our travel and the train, he found two Dutch young women. They must have been just barely teenagers. And they were both pregnant. And my father asked him, well, who is the father? And they could only say, a Hans from the Marines. That's all, that's all they knew, Hans from the Marines. So they said, you join our family. Of course, we had hardly anything to eat. And he would say to my mom, the little stove that there was, Mom, you just add a little bit more water to the soup. There'll be enough for another two. He felt so sorry for these women who were uh, disowned because of what has happened to them. And also there were only three men in that, uh, that hallway. There was no room on the ground for my sister and I. So we put the mattresses on a beautiful large piano. And so I said to my sister, well, I'm not very musical, but maybe sleeping on the piano, I might get a little bit of music. So my father told the three men, only three men, the rest were women and um, children. And my father said, they are not allowed to smoke in the hall where all of the families were only outside of the room. And so the three men and my father, when they were smoking, they took the, the cigarette butts and threw them in the toilet and flushed the toilet. Well, we didn't know that there was a uh, gentleman from a, a German secret service who actually was watching us foreigners. And he's watching these three men doing something he thought reading something and then throwing it into the toilet and flushing it. And they knew that my father was sort of in charge of all of that. So they said, oh, they're spies. They must be spies. They're getting some messages. After reading it, they flushed it down the toilet. So my father received a little notice brought to him that next day he's supposed to come to the, to the Gestapo to report there. Well, my father was very, very wise. Every evening, I remember, he and my mother would try to go for a walk away from the people to be able to talk without being heard. But that day, my father, who was a perfect gentleman, he came over, and he always had a hat, and took off his hat. He gave me a kiss, my sister a kiss, and hugged us and said, be good girls. And he left with my mother. And my sister and I looked at each other. He never did that before. I mean, he would always say, I'll be right back, but never so formerly. And so he left. My mother came back by herself. We said, Mom, too, where is that call? And she said, that means be quiet. In other words, don't ask anymore. So we understood uh, hand language and face language because we've gone through these things. And so as a result of that, my uh, sister was kind of the organizer, although she was only 10 by that time. She and my mother and the two boys escaped from there and went, they, we were so close to the Austrian border, they went across the river and left to the Austrian side. By that time, the Austrians had already laid down their arms. The Aust they no longer wanted to fight for Hitler's war. But the problem is that I, received a, or I became very sick with a terrible stomach illness that is really, can be fatal. It's a ruhr, which means you just do not, it's a very dangerous uh, sickness on your tummy. So I was taken to the hospital. 
and I'm in a hospital and nobody there except, I mean, my family's all gone. And I was asking, where's my family? Nobody knew where my family was because my mom, as they left, they told one of the ladies that were there, please take care of my daughter. They knew they couldn't take me with them. And so it was a horrible few weeks for me, not knowing where, the, where my family is and uh, crying, of course, all the time and not speaking the language. Uh, I, I think one of the worst periods of my life. And one day I see my sister came and she has a paper bag with her. And she was, we became streetwise. So she came and she said to the nun, to the sister, um, I am her sister. And of course I confirmed she was my sister. Could I take my sister out for some fresh air? And so the nun says, no, no, you're not allowed to. But then she says, well, just for a little fresh air because she needs fresh air. So we went out and my sister just went again like this, don't talk, don't say anything. So she went out into the bushes. She took my clothes off, gave me my, because I only had a nightgown, a hospital nightgown. She put some clothing on me and says, Kitsunia, we're running away. And I said, Dotka, we all said, we got to, it's the only way. So we went to the same spot across the river into the Austrian side and ran to where my parents were. Meanwhile, they were in a guest house which is a, like a small um, motel, and the owners had abandoned it because they were uh, already, it was already a war zone. And so they abandoned it. The only pe people left was my father, my mother, and uh, the four of us. And my, bless my father, in the, the building was made headquarters for the SS German army. So in that building were 22 soldiers in black outfit as the SS wore it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Meanwhile, we didn't know where our older two brothers were that were in Prague when we were already in Germany. And so my father would find, find potato and carrots in the bunker of that uh, motel. He'd lug it up and took big buckets and peeling potatoes day and night, making soup. And, and the German soldiers, they were all young, some were 14, 15, 16. And I find, we find my sister and I laying on one bed and we'd wake up and we'd have four or five soldiers inclined on our bed, sitting on the floor inclined, fast asleep, hungry. So my father would give us little soup bowls and a spoon. He says, feed the boys because they were hungry. And he told them, he says, look, there's still some clothing left here in the, by the owners. Change your clothing, save your life, get rid of your uniforms. Oh no, that, that would be treason. So one day, uh, as the cannons were shooting more and more and we saw um, couriers being shot, uh, shut down. And as they were shut down, the, all of a sudden there were people gathering there out of the woods, pulling off their boots because they, some needed them. Others were taking off their golden teeth and so forth. And that was a horrible thing for us to see that this body was left and whatever was left that could still be used, that people would take advantage of it. Horse was killed under one courier and people went there and took the beat. And of course, my father did also, so that we had some nourishment, something to eat. At that time, we didn't know what was clean. It was unclean food. Food was food just so that we survive. And so one day my father said, look, too dangerous for us to be on top of the building because since this was the headquarters, there would be war right in our doorsteps. So he sent me and my two little brothers down and uh, my sister helped in the kitchen, and uh, my one little brother, oh my, he was a, a, just a fireball, four years old, and he ran away from me and climbed up the stairs, and I knew I'm going to get a beating if I let him get out of the house because of the shooting all around us. And as I ran after him, all of a sudden I look a giant standing there, to me a giant, in a white military uniform, white boots. And I thought, I didn't see any German soldiers with white boots. And I was coming out the back door, and there was a front door on this side 
we knew that the French were coming from this side, so the, the military head officer was watching through his binocular the front to see when the French were coming so that his soldiers could defend them. And I was at the back door, and this soldier came to the back door. And he looks at me with a bayonet all geared, and he was chewing something in his mouth. And he said in kind of bad German, where is the general? Where is the general? I thought, why is he chewing something? So I said, right over there through that door. And I looked as he went away, and I saw him putting the bayonet into around the soldier, and with the other hand taking off his binoculars, I ran to my father. I said, Tatko, I'm confused. Why would one soldier do this to another soldier? My father understood immediately. So, bottom line, the German military were looking for the French to come from the, through the front door, and the Americans came through the hill into the building, knowing that this was the German headquarters. My father dropped everything. He took us upstairs, put us under the bed, because he knew now it's really going to be hot, because before you knew the entire American troop that was there was in the building. So first my father said, soup, you know, I give you. Oh, they said, no, they were not allowed to touch at all. I'm sure they were hungry. And so here we are under the bed, and my father and my mother climbed to look through the window, and I hear my father saying to my mother, I wonder where our sons are now. And I was wondering why my father saying that. So being so much in love with my dad, I crawled out from under the bed, although my dad said we shouldn't, to follow him. And I peeked through the window and I saw a line of the black uniforms. First we heard one shot. So one soldier was shot in the building already. And we saw 21 young men walking in a line of black with a black uniform, with their hands behind their heads. And pretty soon we saw the, sh the Americans shooting down the 21 boys, and we saw the blood on the white snow, and that was the end of that story. And the Americans immediately asked my father who he was. He showed his documents that he was actually uh, a forced laborer in the country. They immediately accepted that, especially since he was trying to feed them whatever he cooked. And shortly afterwards, they sent trucks and they were gathering people like us who really were there, not because of we wanted to be in Germany, in order to put us into a DP camp. That's a displaced persons camp. And we desperately tried to be taken from there to one of the free countries. But as the devil wins sometimes, my youngest brother got tuberculosis. So America would not accept us with, or anybody that had an illness such as tuberculosis. We tried that. Canada would not accept it. Argentina did not accept us. So we were in the camp for three and a half years until in August, Brazil finally uh, said that they would be glad to accept us. And so after three and a half years in that camp, I remember we left, we were taken again into trains. Finally, we're going to a free country. And so we were taken by train to Bremenhaven, which is a northern part of Germany. And as we arrived there about two weeks later, we were taken on a German, pardon me, on an American ship, SS General Heinzelmann. And how I remember that name is a miracle to me, but some things you don't forget. And so we're on the ship crossing the equator and uh, the Americans in the somehow the uh, um, Navy custom, they would dunk people uh, because of the God of the sea, and they gave us an enormous uh, plaque. And I still have it in my living room. We only got one per family, and that one has my younger brother's name on it. And so we crossed the equator, arrived in Brazil, and here we see the beautiful Copacabana Beach from far away. And we said, there is life beyond war. There is life beyond death. Because we saw a lot of death during that time. One instance that I think would be 
important to mention what formed my life. We knew that the airplanes, um, foreign airplanes, they were engaged in killing children, school children, because that's the best way to demoralize the public. That's what the Russians are doing now. And they, the armies of, that were engaged were not any better. I'm not going to name the nation, but my father knew that, and he said, Kitsunyu, when you walk from school, you hear airplanes coming, fall, and if you can, find a ravine. And so we're walking, school children, school was out, and I'm walking next to my girlfriend, Eva, and we're scapping, scapping around, and all of a sudden, the airplanes. I looked back and I said, Eva, fall. And she fell, and I was right next to the ravine. So I rolled down the ravine, and and they were up again. And I sat there, of course, you know, your heart is almost as loud as the gun shooting. And I got up, and I want to uh, pick up, or rather tell Eva, get up, get up, we have to run now. And I said, Eva, Eva, get up. And I look, and she's not moving. I said, Eva, and as I lifted her a little bit, I saw the blood. She was totally immersed in her blood. And I looked at it, and I said, what happened? And she was just laughing with me. Why isn't she talking with me? And that was my experience with direct death. And that, why I'm mentioning it, because that was the greatest battle I had with God and with the religion that I was taught. Uh, although my father was Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, my mother Greek Catholic, uh, I was told that when you die, your soul goes to one of the three places. And I thought, I didn't see her soul go anywhere. What, what happened to my girlfriend? And so, uh, that I'm just mentioning, Stacy, that that's the reason why I'm uh, saying that. So here we're arriving in Brazil, and we're taken to a Ilha das Flores, which is actually the Isle of Flowers. But it was an Isle of Flowers. It was like Ellis Island in in New York, and we were again put all together, and most, or I should say many of the people that came from that boat and ended up in Isle of Flores. The men gave up. They gave up. We were told that we're each going to get 20 cruzeiros and the door would open and you can go. Uh, we, you have to try to get a job. And uh, many men at that time, within a week, committed suicide because they just could not, could not cope it. After having lose, lost everything, now starting all over again, strange land, strange language, nothing except 20 cruzeiros. 20 cruzeiros is about $50. And so, um, fortunately, uh, through one episode, but uh, it's too long to mention, I was again lost from my parents, and a German lady was going to adopt me. And all the adoption was done, and again, as I say, I was lost from my parents. But through the Red Cross, uh, my family found me, and my sister came, that was way up north, in which is uh, Königsberg, which is now is Kaliningrad. And so my sister came just about two days before the adoption was completed and uh, took me back to my family, which really is good because Russia uh, dominates now that city. I would have been under Russian domination. So uh, here we are. I, she was wonderful to me. She taught me German so that German is actually almost a second perfect, perfect language for me. And uh, so uh, a family came to the uh, Isle of Flowers to offer jobs. And one very wealthy lady came, and she needed a governess for her three boys. And so she found out that I speak perfect German. She wanted them to be taught German because their father was German. And so, although I didn't speak Portuguese, but she spoke German. So I was the first one to get off island. By that time, I was uh, 14, going my 15th year. But... Uh, in maturity, I was about 21. So here I'm employed with her, it was not the best thing. The boys were very naughty. I was black and blue on my shins. They would be kicking me around. And I swore I will never, never have boys for, for my children. I'll just have daughters. And uh, but the Lord fortunately arranged it a different way. 
And the situation was so bad in, in that atmosphere that I said, Lord, um, I did pray, but I must add to it. God was always a reality for me, but not really in a sense that I loved him. It was just kind of a, like a break, you break on a car in order to stop. Well, God was kind of a break for me. If I didn't know anything else to do, I would say, well, God, please help me. And so I said, God, please help me. It was a horrible situation. She lived with a, uh, a boyfriend that was not her husband and uh, was not the atmosphere I wanted to be in. So one month later, I decided there has to be something better. And um, somewhere along the line, I don't know when, I had a little camera. And I remembered, well, you know how to use a camera. So I decided, I took a, 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 a dictionary, Portuguese dictionary, into German, and I said, I need to find in the newspaper a somebody who does photography. And so I did find uh, Irena Photo Studio in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And I trot along my one pair of shoes that I received from this lady. By the way, she never paid my one month salary because I left her. So I said, that's all right. I arrived and I introduced myself to the owner, Irena Studio. Uh, she spoke German and uh, she says, do you have experience? Oh, yes, I have experience. And so she asked me what my age was and I kind of straightened myself out and I said, well, I'm going to be 19 my next birthday. And so I said, well, that will do. And so that was my first job in uh, Brazil. But my desire was quickly to learn the language in order to progress. So this was my beginning in Brazil. And I very quickly learned that it's very nice to have some money in your pocket. And the only exposure I had to money when I was my ninth birthday, and the lady who was adopting me said that she's going to give me money so I can take three of her, my girlfriends to a movie. She made a beautiful sweater for me, which I never had a new sweater in my life, and a very beautiful skirt. And she put some paper in my hand. And she said, you hold it, and then you go to the movie, and when you say bezahlen, which means paying, on the top, then you give this to money, and they will let you go into the movie. I said, oh, that's how it works, okay? I'm holding my fist. Nobody's going to open that one. So I went there, and I see bezahlen, okay? I paid it. We girlfriends went in. The man put some more money into my pocket. I said, oh, that's good. I'm getting more than I had. I had only one. Now I have more paper. So I took that and gave it back to Miss Hoon. Her name is uh, Fräulein Hoon. The reason I'm mentioning it, because now I've decided my first paycheck in photography. I said, that feels good. I can buy a pair of shoes because I don't have nice shoes. And I deserve them because I always had used shoes that were sent by Americans to, to our to Landek at that time and we had to scrounge around, make sure we find two matching shoes. So that was very good. So I said, well, there must be another way of making money. By that time, um, I don't have many talents, but God gave me talents to learn languages. So I think within three months, I really had a, a passing conversational Portuguese. And so I thought, well, let's see, how else can we make money? And somehow I heard that people, when they travel, they buy tickets at a certain place called travel agency. And when they buy the tickets, then the travel agency makes some money. I said, oh, well, I speak German, I speak Ukrainian, and I speak now Portuguese. Uh, maybe that's going to help. So I went to a travel agency and I said, I have experience. God may forgive me for lying, but that's part of, unfortunately, survival skills. And, and I just want to make it clear, I don't use that survival skill anymore. So I said, I have experience. And after a few months, I realized that's good money. Maybe I can get a little room and I can get people who want to travel, and I can make contact with airlines, and I will make that money. Uh, 
And so, make the story short, I organized a travel agency. And through that travel agency, I was able to uh, find out that at that time, China in, um, uh, had um, really filled with communism, and under their rule was a very large group of Russian people. And the Russian people wanted to leave China and were leaving in droves and were in Hong Kong. And I found out that Brazil is willing to accept these people to Brazil. And on the other hand, I saw that in Brazil, there were many Japanese people, and the Japanese people dominated the agriculture. All the vegetables and everything were made by the Japanese. So I thought, how could I do it so that I can bring the Russian people to Brazil and take the Japanese people to uh, Japan to visit their families whom they have not visited for at least the last 25 years. So I thought, well, since Brazil wants these people, maybe I should talk to the Brazilian government and charter some airplanes because there are a lot of people there that I should transport. That's more than just individual tickets. And so, make the story short again, I did. The only thing, Brazilian government gave me all the documents giving permission to bring foreign airplanes with foreigners to Brazil, but they would not lease the, tick, the airplanes. So through a gentleman that I uh, made acquaintance with, I talked with him about it. He was Russian, and of course Russian and Ukraine are very similar. Since then, of course, I learned Russian, but I did not know Russian. And he says, you know, I know General Claire Lee Chenault. He is an American hero, and um, he formed a Chinese airline. Let me talk to him. He is in Taipei, Formosa. Let's see if he would lease us the airplanes to take the uh, Russians from Hong Kong. I said, excellent idea. So we got in contact with General Chenault, and he said, be delighted to. I can lease 10 airplanes for, for about 90 days. I said, that's fantastic. So here we are in contract with General Chenault, and I'm supposed to go and meet with him in Taipei. Meanwhile, I'm married and I have a little baby boy. My boy is a year and a half. I, to my sadness, I must mention that uh, I married a gentleman who was very charming, but was very much against children. And he did not want the first child, and I wanted to. So there was already friction there. But uh, here I am making the contract with General Chenault. Everything is prepared. Uh, General Chenault knew uh, Mr. Igor Sikorsky, the inventor of helicopters. He was in Washington, New York, and uh, he talked with uh, Mr. Sikorsky whether he would finance part of it, and Mr. Sikorsky agreed. So Mr. Sikorsky got in touch with me and says, Kalina, when you come, you fly to Washington, I want to meet you, and I will give you the cash to take the General Chenault for the enterprise. And I feel like I'm big stuff. I'm really big stuff. And so we're <laughs> arriving in Washington, and uh, I got a call from uh, um, Mr. Sikorsky. He invited me for lunch. Charming gentleman, very, very short statue, but a very charming man. And he says, yes, I agreed with General Chenault. Here is a check for $10,000. Oh, my goodness. I said, Kika, $10,000. And I converted into cruzeiros. I am really wealthy now. Do I still need God? I've got everything that I need. I'm flying to the Orient. And by that time, I was 21 years old, but nobody knew that. And another thing that happened... I just found out that God is blessing me with another baby. And uh, I really had a hard time convincing my husband about it. He said, absolutely not. May I be very frank on, and I speak about it? It's a human situation. Absolutely not. We already have one bread. Absolutely not. You have to abort this child. 
I said, I want the child. I want him to be another one to the other. Absolutely not. I'm against it. Tall, big British men and rather cruel. Uh, so I said, well, sometimes you have to really ask for God for wi wisdom. So I said, all right, all right, let me your will. In Brazil, you could actually alleviate yourself from a pregnancy simply by going to a drugstore, have an injection, and that would take care of it. So we walk and he says, here's the drugstore. Here's 20 cruzeiros. Go in there and take care of it. So I said, oh, of course I will. I walked in there. I said to the pharmacist, listen, buddy, here's your 20 cruzeiros. If that big tall man asks you whether you give me injection, you say, yes, I did. See, si, see. Si. And I walked out, and that was it, my saving my child, which is Mickey. So I'm in Ori. I'm still in Washington. I go with this check to a bank, and they look at me. They must have known that I'm not as old as somebody who would have this check, and signed by Igor Sikorsky. So she, how did you get the check? I said, ma'am, I got it from the gentleman who signed it. I see her go to the phone calling and I hear, he says, oh, 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 well, well, that's okay then. Oh, okay, yes, of course, we'll honor it. So they called Mrs. Sikorsky and he confirmed. So I arrive in Hong Kong, a very, very lonely trip. I was assigned by General Chenault, a gentleman by the name of Earl Willoughby. He was supposed to kind of be my companion there and lead me to make sure that nothing happens with me. But it was most, one of the most loneliest uh, things that I've had in my life. But as far as God is concerned, I thought, do I really need God? Did God take care of me when I saw all the people dead around me? Most of them I didn't even mention. I said, not now. Sometime maybe I will have time for God. Here I am in Hong Kong and taking a flight to Formosa to meet with John Chenault, charming gentleman married to a young Chinese lady. I shared the money. He said, no, you keep this in order for your expenses. When you, I had to travel to Japan, to Tokyo, in order to meet with a Japanese uh, group because we're going to be taking Japanese people to Brazil and then fly to Hong Kong and take the uh, Russian people, fly them to um, uh, Rio. And this would be 10 trips back and forth. So if, actually, the birth of charter airplanes. And so I had two airplane loads of Japanese people sitting in a hotel in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And I had two uh, airplane loads of Russians sitting in a Hong Kong hotel. So everything is going so far fine. We re received from the Japanese government permission uh, from Hong Kong. We received permission through General Chenault. Everything is wonderful. And I say, who needs God? I am on top of the world. I have money in my hand that I never dreamt I would even think of having funds like this. Um, I'm in the front pages of Japanese newspaper. This lady is bringing Japanese people from Brazil to visit their family. I still have the Japanese writings from the Japanese papers. Uh, I'm visited by the Brazilian consul, treating me out for lunch. I have people, my clients who were in Japan, Brazilian clients, English clients, inviting me for lunch, all that in the, published in the paper. And I said to myself, I am on top of the hill. So God somehow became secondary. It's just in, in case I fall down, maybe there is a God. But right now I'm really so busy, I do not have time to devote my thoughts to that. Well, I received a call from General Chenault. And just before the first flight was supposed to start, and he said, Kika, I'm very sorry. I have some bad news for you. And I thought, well, maybe he cannot meet me for lunch or something. And he said, I have to cancel my contract. I said, why cancel the contract? Because I'm under the military contract of Formosa, Taipei. And right now, uh, Chiang Kai-shek was starting to make war with Formosa, and I need to use the airplanes for military services in the service of of the National East Chinese Airplane. So I said, 
as of when? He said, as of immediately. He was so wonderful to me. He was very fatherly. Uh, when we went out for dinner in uh, Tokyo, he invited all the pilots from CAT, the name of the airline, and he had them all signed a, the menu card for me, and he signed it for me. A wonderful gentleman. And he says, Kika, you can sue me, and you can probably win the suit. I said, General Chenault, how can I sue a gentleman that has been so wonderful to me? I said, no, I cannot do that. And so I lay down, I look up the sky and I said, what happened? Total collapse of my life. I was on the top of the hill. I thought I owned the world and I have nothing. I have debts of two loads of passengers sitting in a fancy hotel in Hong Kong and two loads of passengers sitting in a fancy hotel in Sao Paulo, Brazil. This bill has to be paid or these bills have to be paid. I have nothing and I am expecting my second child. And I said, how low can you fall? Then I thought the highest you go, the lowest you fall. I take my flight back to Brazil, absolutely desperate. What am I going to do? A husband who does not want children, a husband who is worth nothing. There were some very negative things that happened in my absence. And where am I going to go? And so somehow, I must say, the Lord allows us to fall so far back that when you turn, you cannot look in any way other than to look up. And that is the moment that I looked up and I remembered, I remember that I heard my mother say that there is a God that does take care of you, that there is a God that you can come with all your sorrows to you. And I kneeled down and I said, God, I don't know you. I don't know why you're punishing me like that. I do not know why you took everything away. I couldn't even pay rent anymore in the apartment that I was. And the gentleman that owned the apartment removed the lock so I couldn't even lock the door anymore because I couldn't pay rent. So here I am with one and a half babies. I left their father because when he found out that I'm still expecting the child, he had the audacity to say that that child cannot be his because after all, he was a witness when I made sure that I adopted the child. So here I was all alone with one and a half babies and a collapsed world and really knowing God only at a distance. And I thought, Kika, why? Why leave these two little beings in a world, in a cruel world, that has nothing to offer. And so, as Satan very frequently uses opportunities when we're down on the ground to make us feel that there is no way out. And so, unfortunately, that's the thing that he used with me. There is no way out. God is somewhere there, but I don't see him, I don't feel him. And so I foolishly decided that I had nothing. I paid my last maid. I used to have three maids with my wedding dress. And I decided the only way out is to take the life of my little boy, not permit my second boy to be born, baby born. And what's the use of my life in this world? But I said, before I go through with my action, I better go and see my dad. I just had to see my dad one more time. He was a wonderful gentleman. My mom was a wonderful lady, but our relationship was not as good as with my dad. And so they had a farm in Brazil. So I uh, took my little boy tra train and I went to the fazenda. It's called a farm, it's called fazenda. Fazenda and uh, my dad being very observant. And by that time I was in my eighth month of pregnancy. 
He said, Kitsunyo, is there something in your life troubling you? Oh, no, Dad, everything is fine. My parents did not know what I was experiencing. They were far away from me. He said, Kitsunyo, there's something in your life that's troubling you. Oh, no, Dad, nothing wrong. And next day I was going to leave. And as I was packed to leave, well packed, a purse and my little boy, he was one and a half years old, to go to the train station, a mailman came, and he handed my father a letter. And as somehow I glanced, and as I saw the letter, I recognized on the envelope the handwriting of my brother-in-law, my sister's husband. Meanwhile, my sister was already in New York with her husband and a child who was born in Brazil. We had our first children six months apart. Her boy was six months older. And I recognized that handwriting, and my father opened up the letter, gave it to my mom, and went like this with his head, which to me was still my language from the days of war. That means don't talk. And I saw my mother taking the letter to her bedroom, and I heard her cry. And I went into the bedroom. I said, Mom, could I see the letter? She said, no, 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 it's, it's nothing. It's just, uh, and Tatku says, no, 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 no. I said, Tatku, you know, I'd rather know something horrible than to leave not knowing what the horrible is. And so he looked at Mansu, he looked at me, he embraced me and showed me the letter. And in there, my sister, my brother-in-law wrote, could Colleen, in other words, could I please come to New York because my sister had a nervous breakdown. She lost her baby in a crib death. He was nine months old. And I just have to take a deep breath now because at that moment, like a lightning went through my mind. I knew I had to go to New York to be with my sister, my only sister. And a thought came through my mind. Is it possible that God dared to take one child to save three because the very next day I wouldn't be here anymore? So I arrived in Brazil. I called my brother-in-law. I said, Luis, I do not have any money, but I have six strands of beautiful pearls that I brought from Japan. That's the only thing that I have. I said, I will give them to you. Will you pay for my trip? And so he sent me the uh, flight ticket, and I knew all the captains because of my travel business. So I called the captain of Arenas Brazil, and I said, Mario, you... I don't know if you knew, you knew about the situation that I left my husband. And he said, congratulations at that time. So he said, I said, Mario, but I'm in my eighth month of pregnancy. He thought for a moment, he said, ah, Kika, it wouldn't be the first baby I delivered on flight. I'll take you. He was the chief captain on the flight. He says, I'm flying on such and such a day. You come to the airport. I'll get you on the flight. Put on something looking kind of loose and uh, I'll get you on the flight. So that was arranged. And uh, I was at the airport, ready to go with two suitcases. My little lively boy, who was nearly two years old, well, one and a half years old. My mother was there, my oldest brother. And we're ready to leave. Now, I must say here that it was against the law to take a child out of Brazil without the permission of the father. And uh, I acquired the permission only because of my good relationships through my travel agency with all the authorities in Rio. And so I did have that permission in the passport. And uh, so we're sitting in Brazil quite frequently. The power would go out throughout Brazil and throughout even at the airport. That's why there were candles placed all over the place. So I'm sitting next to my mother, my party. I, we both knew that we probably will not see each other anymore. And my wonderful brother, my older brother, who was our protector, I must say, second brother, he is the one that right now is fighting for his life in New York. He had uh, COVID and they cannot stabilize his uh, uh, oxygen in his body. And so uh, he's sitting there and all of a sudden my mom says, my back was towards the front door. My mom says, Kika, freeze. 
And of course, from my previous experience, I knew it means freeze. I said back, I said, what is happening? She says, my uh, Ricky's uh, biological father's first name was Harvey. He said, Harvey just walked in the front door. He was, uh, his job often took him to the airport uh, because he worked for a company that um, he took care of VIPs when VIPs would arrive in Rio. And unexpectedly, he is walking through the front door. And now I say, Lord, that's the end of my journey. So somehow I said, God, it was your fault that I'm still alive. It is your fault that I'm sitting here. Please do not let this, this journey that you're putting me on be interrupted right now because of the person that walked in. I hardly said amen. And the light goes out at the airport. And they put the candles on. Mario came out of the uh, uh, pilot's quarters and he says, Kika, ready to go? I said, I'm ready to go. And uh, I whispered to him quickly. He knew my family relationship. So I just embraced my mom, not turning to there, uh, embraced my brother. Mario took my luggage, took my boy, and he went into the uh, captain's quarters. So the second time, God sent something that was totally inexplicably in order to somehow still have me be alive. And so two days later, we had a handicap in the airplane. Uh, we had to spend quite a few hours in Recife, which is northern part of Brazil. We arrive in Miami. At that time, I thought that I would deliver at the airplane, I guess, all the, all the excitement. So Mario sent a telegram to uh, the airport to receive me there. And as we arrive, the station manager happens to be a young man that I knew very well who was wanting to court me and uh, marry me, but that wasn't to be. And he says, well, Kika, I'm here. If you, if you have to go to the airport, I'm taking you. And I said, no, uh, everything is fine. I think I'm going to make it to New York. So you see, the Lord had preparation. He prepares things way ahead before I know that I'm going to need it. So I boarded the plane from Miami to New York, and that was the moment that I collapsed somehow in the knowledge. There are some loving arms around me. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. And I made it well to New York. My brother-in-law um, took me from the airport, and Mickey was born two weeks later, and uh, Everything was well. I delivered an 11 pound, very healthy baby. And I had my wish. I wanted to have two boys together in order to play. And two weeks later, I'm wheeling uh, Mickey and Ricky both in the carriage. I'm walking in Central Park in New York. And it's autumn. Mickey was born October 30. And I see a lot of yellow leaves there. And I said, oh, this is beautiful. Then I see a green leaf there. I thought, that's strange. I don't see any green leaves. I pick it up, it was a dollar bill. And I said, oh, I was told that in America, money grows on trees. So I kept the dollar bill. But of course, I knew it was two weeks since delivery of my boy. My English was not very good. I knew I had to earn money for my two little babies. Um, I had one tiny little room in a small apartment where my sister and her husband lived with their one boy. And so at uh, two months after, to two weeks after giving delivery to my boy, I looked through the newspaper, what can I do? I don't speak well English to be the travel business. And I saw Arthur Murray as seeking people to be dance instructors. I said, I can do that. I used to love to dance, and I wasn't too bad at a dancer. I was often asked to dance when we were in company before. So I applied. You have experience? Oh, yes, I have experience. Of course I did. I danced all my life. I even danced in front of Hitler, by the way, once and as, as a child. We were asked to dance uh, when he was visiting certain places where we were in the orphanage. So I became a dance instructor. But uh, it didn't take me long to realize that most gentlemen don't go to Arthur Murray to learn to dance. 
uh, it seems to be a nice place to meet the dance teachers. And so again, that job was not something that I would relish. So uh, a month into my, I resigned my position. I said, well, now I've learned a little bit English. I was reading whatever I could get during the intervals while I was not dancing, reading English, reading English, a little bit aloud, because the best way to learn the language is if you read aloud. And so I thought, I think I'm ready to fake it with my English language and go into travel business again. And I looked at the newspaper, and KLM, Dutch airline, was hiring people to the airline. And of course, with my experience, I was eminently qualified, even with not so good English. So I applied and immediately I was asked if I could st start next day. So that was a very good beginning. A few weeks later, well, a few months later, a German girlfriend that was also working there said, you know, the German airline, that was in 1955. The German airline is opening up their office in uh, New York. She was German, and she says, Kika, won't you come? Let's both apply and work for Lufthansa. Their income we will get there is more than we're getting here. So, oh, when I hear better income, my ears perked up. I said, sure. So I went there, and uh, there were just three gentlemen in one room. They heard my uh, qualification, they can you start today? I said, no, I have to give a notice to my present employer. And I started immediately with a management position. And uh, life was beginning to be good. But uh, there was one situation, one of the gentlemen uh, became extremely interested in me. And uh, I was not uh, in a position where I wanted to jump from a uh, frying pan into fire. And so I, uh, that wasn't something I really uh, cherished. And so I always, he was in a management position and I asked for a transfer to another city, to the same company, Lufthansa. And for some reason, every time I applied, I was always denied the application. I couldn't understand because they knew my qualifications until I found out that that gentleman had his body was even in a higher management. And so I always received, well, maybe I don't type 300 words a minute on a typewriter, so I'm not qualified. Or maybe another little disqualification so that I wouldn't transfer. So I said, well, I, I have to do something. Something, something mentioned, I, I have to leave. So again, I knew I wanted to get as far away California would be the farthest away. So I started looking in California whether there would be a position, and sure enough, there was another airline that was looking for a person with my qualifications. So I packed up my little boys, no security yet, but I knew I had that position. I got into the car, not a very good car, but it was moving, and uh, I knew I might get, with God's help, I'll get to California. So I love to read, and I, before I fall asleep, I must read a little bit. So we were in a hotel, and I'm looking for something to read. It was late, it was midnight, and I pulled out a draw, and in there I saw a telephone book. I pulled out another draw, and there I saw a book. And I looked again, beautiful picture of Christ kneeled down, and the moonlight, and he was praying. And I looked again. I never saw Jesus like that. I saw Jesus on the cross. I saw blood dripping from his uh, hands and feet on pictures, but I never saw Jesus as a human being kneeled down praying. And the title, The Desire of Ages. And I thought, what could the ages desire? Maybe it's what they, I desire, and that is to find a friend. So I took the book, boys were sleeping and I'm reading. I couldn't put it down. So I saw the light coming up already. So I better get some snooze for a couple of hours. I got a long road to go. And I said, I can't put the book down again. I have to steal it. So I often say, I stole the book in order to read myself into the truth. So I said, no, you cannot steal. That's not right. Your dad always said you don't steal. No, and he was very strict about that. No lying, no stealing. So 
I said, okay, I have two dollars. I put the two dollars down and I put my address of the work where I was going to be working in San Francisco. So I arrived, I read it. But first of all, before I did, I looked for the imprimatura in the book. I don't know if you know that Catholic Church gives permission to their people to read religious books. And if the imprimatura, they call, is not printed in the book that there's a permission to read it, you're not allowed to read it. So before I started reading it, I looked front, back, no imprimatura. So I said, well, I know it's a sin, it's apparently not a Catholic book, but uh, it's such a good book. I, I'll go to confession afterwards. I'll finish it. So I finished the book. And as I finished it, I opened it. And there is first page and second page were glued together. And I looked, there is a pen handwriting in there. I looked again and it says, this book was placed in a motel for your enjoyment by the, mili by the Young People's um, Society of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Lincoln, Nebraska. Oh my goodness, I closed it. Now I really have to confess. And then I thought, open it again. What is that? Not Catholic. Seventh-day Adventist Church? Who is that? So I said, well, if they wrote such a beautiful book, uh, maybe I can find the church and go there, and then I have two things to confess for. I read the book, and I went to a Protestant church. That will work. So I came to Los Angeles. Um, very shortly, I was transferred from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And the first thing I did, I'm looking for the Seventh-day Adventist church. And I thought maybe I can find one in German, which would be closer to, my, to me for spiritual things in the German language. And sure enough, I read German Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so I, okay, I called. A very friendly gentleman said, yes, uh, we do meet. We'll be welcome to see you on Saturday. I said, you mean Sunday? No, 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 we meet Saturday. I said, you mean as Saturday? In, in German, Samstag? He said, yes, Saturday. Okay. He told me the time. So on that Saturday, he says, I'm not going to be there, but you will be welcome there. So I take a bus, of course I had at that time no more a car. So I took a bus, my two little tots next to me, and I said, Kika, that you go in the church, that's bad enough. You want to take your boys into a Protestant church and have already a sin on their souls? You can't do that. And I, I went into it. I almost had a handle of the church, and I said, no, no, I cannot do that. I walked, I said, no, no, go, no, no, I can't. Third time I took hold of their handle, I said, you'll go to confess and go ahead, go in. And so I opened up the door, and I go in there, I'm looking for the holy water, nothing next to the door. I thought maybe they placed it somewhere else. And I'm trembling from fear, trembling. I think, Kika, what are you doing? And I said, and there's a gentleman talking from front. He doesn't have a priest garb on. He has a suit on. And he has a book. And he has, talks out of the book. And the things that he's talking is about that Jesus is going to come and then he's going to take us from here. My ears perked up and a gent elderly gentleman was sitting in a bench just to the side and he saw I didn't have a Bible. So he brought and gave me the book and my hands are trembling, little boys next to me and I open it pretending I know what I'm opening and he's came to me and he realized I have it upside down. So he put the Bible in my mind, look properly, my hands are trembling. And he would open up the passages that the, the pastor was quoting and in order for me to read. And I'm reading, I don't have a Bible. And I'm reading it and I cannot believe what I read. And what I read, for some reason, it was John 14. I have to take a deep breath again. Because as I read that, that became my favorite verse. And I read, and I thought, only a very loving God could compose a sentence like this. Do not let your hearts be troubled. 
You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you unto myself so that where I am, you can be also. And where I go, you know, and the place where it is, you know. And I thought, really? I'm going to have a home with God that is preparing it for me? I like to say jokingly, moi, Miss Piggy. And that was so touching for me that I left the church. I went to the bus stop. Somehow the church was not, I, they shook my hand and I see myself outside. I look for a bus stop. I went on the bus and I'm going home and I cannot get that verse out of my mind. Now I don't have a Bible yet, but I memorized that and I'm repeating it. You mean God is preparing a home for me. That's real, that's real and I will be with him forever, and my boys will be with him forever. Well, maybe I should still confess. And then I thought, it didn't say that I have to confess. It didn't say you confess first and then I'll prepare a place for you. So I said, maybe I shouldn't confess. And so I decided maybe I should know a little bit more about it. And as I thought about it, the pastor called next day and he says, I understand you were there and I would love to study with you. Oh, I heard her study. I said, I'd be delighted to. I am going to make a Catholic out of the gentleman because I know my Catholicism. Oh, I helped other people to become Catholic. So that was wonderful. So the gentleman came Wednesday evening. I put my little tots to bed. I'm prepared. My Catholicism is here and I'm prepared. And he opened up the Bible. I, my Catholicism, and he started talking to me about God's love. Well, that kind of beat me because I couldn't do that out of the catechism. And I started saying, well, you know, the Catholic Church, the only true church. And the pathos says, well, uh, and I said, what is your opinion? He says, well, my opinion really doesn't count. Let's see what the word of God says. And he pointed out, he says, I am the truth and I am life. And I said, that's not in my catechism. So to make the story short, the wonderful gentleman was there every Wednesday. And every time I want to combat him, he would say, well, Sister Kika, not what I think, what the word says. And I couldn't fight against that. And so one day he said to me, Sister Kika, you're ready to be baptized. I said, well, Pastor, there's one thing I don't quite understand. I said, what happens to me when I die? And he said, well, I thought we went through the lesson. He said, well, I didn't quite understand. Where does my soul go? I mean, I do have a soul, an eternal soul. So he opened it, and as he explained to me, finally, as a mother of two little boys, I finally understood that there is a loving God that if I accept him and what he did for me, give his life and pay for my debt with his blood he signed, paid in full, that actually I don't have to go through purgatory. I'm sure not going to go to hell. And then when he comes, he's going to take me home and my boys. And that text came back to my mind even more alive. I go to prepare a place for you. That's what the text was written for. And I understood what happens to the death. And I said, Pastor, now I'm ready to give my heart to God. Now I understand this is the truth. Because I said I was lied to and I could never understand it. I saw all the death and I never saw a soul floating anywhere because if it can burn, it must be a substance. And I didn't see that substance leave the body of the people that I saw die. So now I understood the truth, and I praise God for that. And that is my story about how God found a great sinner. And when I was baptized, I remember being on my knees, and a young man was baptized before me, and I was in a pastor's study. And I looked up and I said, Lord, I know you're going to take me home someday, but I think I found home now. I think I found home now. And I said, Lord, would you please help me? to tell this story to everyone that has been lied to like I have, 
that there is a home. There is a home already here in the arms of God. And later on, we're going to experience it when he truly puts his arms around us and we will spend eternity with him. So I dedicated my life right there before I was baptized. Lord, lead me to people that need to know what you have taught me. That has been my desire ever since. I am so delighted when God uses me and I'm humbled about it to be able to sit across people. And as after I became a Bible worker, and I didn't deserve that honor, but I was asked to be a Bible worker at the Central California Conference in San Francisco as member of the Cap Street Church. And I remember sitting across people. First, I was so scared to give a Bible study. Me, I, how dare I, how can I bring this truth, this eternal truth, somebody else? But I pray, I said, Lord, you talk through me. I cannot do it, you talk through me. And I would look at people, and first they were kind of frozen. What does she have to tell me? And then next day, they were kind of receptive. And next day, the warmth I saw in their hearts, I could see through to their soul that the word of God was, was reaching them until finally said, they said, well, Kika, how can I join? what you know, what you have, how can I join the church? I could only embrace them, fall on my knees with them, and say, look, it is God who has penetrated your soul and told you how much he loves you and wants you to have eternal life. And so I've had such wonderful experiences. I could go on and on. When I remember even through through my work, Pastor Benderman came to do evangelistic service, and uh, he asked me if I would help him. And uh, he was giving out names and, and for us to follow up. And I took several of those names, but then a few days before, I had a strange dream. And I told the boys at breakfast, I said, boys, I had a funny dream. Pastor Venneman is giving me a card, and on that card it says, that a person with the name of Riba wants to start Bible studies. And I said, do you know what Riba means? It means fish. I said, can you imagine somebody being called fish? Because Reba in Ukrainian is fish. So three days later, I get that card. I looked at it, I said, Pastor Venneman, I'll take this one. And I went to see that lady, found out she was a Catholic a teacher in the Catholic school teaching the Catholic catechism. Her daughter sent in the card, not she. She was sick and she sent in the card. Again, to make the story short, I started studies with her. Her husband was very opposed to it. I was sitting in the living room. Their small bedroom was next to their living room. He slammed the door so he wouldn't hear me talking. Well, the Lord gifted me with a rather vocal cord that I can increase it if I need to. So I increased my vocal cords a little bit, and I'm giving the Bible study. Next time I came, I saw there was a little crack in the door. And then later on, I saw the crack was bigger. And afterwards, he said, well, uh, you go ahead. I'm, I'm, I want to read the newspaper. I'm going to sit here. He didn't see that I saw that probably the newspaper wasn't even open properly. And we give the Bible studies. Result, Mrs. Ryber, her two daughters, and Mr. Ryber found that God is a place for them when he comes back. And they were baptized and became one of my students. So we serve a wonderful God. We serve a God that has treasures far greater than those that I was seeking when I was thought that I was on top of the world, I could have all the money and all the wealth I wanted to. God was said, that's nothing. That's Satan's treasure. That is passing. I'm offering you a by far greater treasure, and that is eternal life in my arms. And I can say it only as humbly, as sincerely as I can. My desire has been ever since to only use my, shall we say, few talents that God gave me of being talking to people to tell them about only one thing. 
Jesus died so that we can live. And that is to me the greatest message. Through faith in his sacrifice, we can have the grace and have eternal life. And I'm so grateful towards the end of my life, I married to a wonderful gentleman, a Canadian pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist pastor in retirement, whose three brothers also were Catholic and became Adventist pastors. We have a very peaceful life, and he and I have both decided to allow the Lord to use us as long as he gives us breath to do whatever he wants us to do. So my husband was instrumental in building 130 churches in Ukraine with the money he collected from Ukrainian people in Canada. And while he was building churches, I was trying to build up the ability of Seventh-day Adventist Church to be more recognized by the government of Ukraine. That is a long story, and I don't know whether this would be the time to uh, um, continue because we're talking so much about Ukraine. Yeah, um, let's, yeah let's, let's do that. I never wanted to go to Ukraine because I often saw tears in my father's eyes when he spoke of Ukraine. I often thought about that little box of earth that we need to put on his uh, tomb, on his uh, grave. And uh, so Ukraine was the furthest thing from my mind. Although my father was very strict, he continued to uh, influence us children to learn the Ukrainian language. He spoke a beautiful, pure Ukrainian language as educator, and so did my mother. My mother was very intelligent. She spoke also six, seven languages. And so um, uh, Ukraine was the furthest from my mind. However, my second brother, who is in New York now, as I mentioned before, he uh, was a very great patriot. He belonged to Ukrainian clubs in New York, sent his children to Ukrainian schools, uh, scolded me for not teaching my children to speak Ukrainian. And so that was uh, uh, furthest from my mind until one day my brother, whose name is Svitoslav, and I call him Svito, he said, you know, Kika, I uh, went to Ukraine. Ukraine is uh, liberated now, and um, um, I need to help Ukraine. And uh, he said, uh, you know, uh, I need to help them to get some jobs. And I said, but Svito, Ukraine does not have the uh, favored nation status yet. I, I know a little bit about governmental workings. And uh, so he says, no, Ukraine doesn't have. I said, so Ukraine will really have to pay high taxes when they do work and then bring that work to America. And so I said, well, what do you think can be done? I said, well, we need to, first thing you want to do, I said, don't involve me in it. But first thing you need to do is to tell the president of Ukraine that they have to have the most favored nation status. I receive a call a few days later and says, yes, I was talking to the sister of the president. And he says, yes, we realize, but we don't know how to do it. So I said, well, I can tell them how to do it. And Svito says, well, Kika, if you know how to tell them how to do it, do it. I said, Svito, I'm so busy with my family, with my work. And then I said a prayer. I said, Lord, I don't know why you're pushing me into do, do this. You know I want nothing to do with Ukraine. But something in my heart said, Kika, you were born in the cradle of Ukraine. So I called my senator in uh, New York and I said to the senator, Senator, you, I was engaged to help Ukraine to get the most favorable status. I don't uh, really uh, know exactly how to do it. Give me some counsel. He says, well, the uh, country has to apply for it and it will take about two through three years to get it done and it will go through the Senate and once it's approved, then we're going to give it a favorite status. Well, I'm not known for being very patient. So I said, but Senator, there must must be another way of doing it. I don't think, uh, Mrs. Berman, I don't think so. I said, could you do me one favor? Is there a document that shows how it looks? How does a document look as most favorite nature signed? 
um, I said, uh, didn't the Soviet Union have uh, favorite cities? Oh, yes, they do have it. I said, would it be difficult for you to send me a copy of the document that Soviet Union signed so that I can take a look at it and help Ukraine to prepare a similar document? Sure enough, I got a courier letter, and there I have the 17 pages of the agreement. I'm looking at it, and I said, all right, I should copy it, and just where it says Soviet Union, put Ukraine, and so forth. All of a sudden, like a lightning comes into my head, I look at it again, and I say under the most favorite nation for Soviet Union, there are listed all the other nations that were part of the Union. That's why it's called Soviet Union. So I picked up the phone and I said, Mr. Senator, may I ask you a question? You're involved in this um, since Ukraine was part of the Union, then I must assume that Ukraine has a right to the most favored nation and should be able to extract it from that and be given it separately. He said, Mrs. Bermley, you're sure talking loud here. I said, well, Senator, am I right or am I right? He says, well, let me get back to you. So about two days later, he calls me back. He says, by golly, Mrs. Bermley, if you act fast, you can get it done. He says, prepare that in U for Ukraine because the president is coming next week. President uh, of Ukraine is coming to meet uh, president of America. And if you have the document ready, we can have them sign it. Oh, did I get busy. So I copied the entire document, put in Ukraine instead of Soviet Union, got it prepared, shut it through to my brother, because my brother was going to take it to Ukraine to the president, who there then had it quickly okayed by their Senate, bring it to America, and the most favorite nation status was signed. So, and I said, but Svito, don't ask me anymore anything else. I did this for Ukraine only because of you and because our Tatko, our dad. No, no, I, I won't bother you anymore. A few days later, I get, got a call. Uh, Kika, you know, um, there's something not quite right, but you know accounting, I don't know accounting. Would you take a look? I, I bought a business there with Sasha, and he's such an honest man, and I know he wouldn't cheat me, but um, although I don't understand much, what I see here, um, this is a Ukrainian document, and uh, the, the, the figures just don't jive. I said, sure, I'd be glad to. So he sent me, and I immediately could see that this gentleman called Sasha really was cheating my brother. So I del deliberated and deliberated, Kika, go to Ukraine and meet Sasha and tell him off. Uh, because my brother is a wonderful young man, but um, he is very deep involved in real estate, has made wonderful in buying, selling real estate, but accounting was not really his strong point. So finally, because of my brother, I said, Svito, I tell you what, I'm going to go to Ukraine to meet Sasha, but only for two weeks. And don't ask me to do anything else. And then I'm coming home. So he said, that's a deal. So we're leaving for Ukraine. And I'm saying to myself, Kika, don't talk to anybody. Don't ask anything. Just do the situation with Sasha. Straighten that out and head for home. So we arrive, and my brother on the plane told me he bought an apartment in, in uh, Kiev, and he bought a car for Sasha, and uh, uh, so I said, well, that's beautiful, so we have a place to stay. Uh, we are picked up at the airport, and we are picked up in the old shalopy that you almost had to pedal with your feet when it was driving. I'm sitting there with a puff, 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 and I said to the driver, who happens to be a nephew of Sasha. I said to him, Yuri, where is Sasha? Oh, he is in Moldova. Where is the car he bought? Oh, he sent it to his son in Moldova. I said, why is he not need to know that Svito is coming? I don't know. So I said, we're going to the apartment. We arrive in the apartment. A dump full of cockroaches on the walls, dirt in the refrigerator. I can see somebody lives there, or I don't know, really could say sleep. 
I said, Svito, I will probably lay in the bathtub because cockroaches usually don't crawl around and something sleazy. I cannot, I cannot stay here. So we had the light on all day, all night. I was sitting hardly just on the corner of his sofa, making sure no, no cockroaches come near me. Went to the office next day. Sasha came from Moldova because he heard that Svito's sister is coming. I said, Sasha, I want to see the books. To shorten this story, he avoided, avoided until Sasha. If I do not have the books here tomorrow, I will have the police here tomorrow because I do speak Ukrainian. So he showed me the books. Immediately I saw that that, that was all a, a lie. Well, I'm preparing to go back. I told Svito, I said, Svito, in Ukraine you said put a cross on it when it's dead. Put a cross on your business here. Go home. Consider it a loss. Let's go home. So I said, but before I go, my brother is Catholic. He was going to be a priest. And uh, I said, Svito, would you go to a, an Adventist church with me? By the way, when Maya became an Adventist, my father being a sculptor, my mother asked him to make a tombstone with and wrote down on that my name, the date of my birth, and the date of my baptism, because I had died for my family. So my, I lost my entire family. But the only thing I could remember is the night before I was baptized, I had a tremendous fight. Satan was fighting for me with all his might. He said, how can you take your boys with you into hell? And I remember, Stacy, my boys are laying on my bed. I'm holding on to the mattress on my knees, and I'm with my nails digging into it, and I say, God, I cannot, I cannot leave the Catholic Church. It's the only true church. And all the time a text comes to my mind. If you love mother or father or brother or sister, you love more than me. You're not worthy of me. I said, but God, I am worthy of you. So I remember the battle that I had. And of course, my brother was very prejudiced against it. He knew what my father made the tombstone for me. But I thought I'd give it a chance. I said, Svito, I came here to Ukraine, you asked me to come. I said, I'm not going to insist, but would you go to an Adventist church with me? Uh, he says, are they real people? I said, yes, and I can assure you they're real people. They won't bite you, I'll protect you. And so I had to find an Adventist church. Nobody knew about an Adventist church until the driver in the hotel heard that I'm saying in Ukrainian, uh, in Ukrainian translate, Tserkva Semohodnya meaning the church of the seventh day. And he came and says, oh, I know it, I know they are. Uh, they're meeting with another denomination in a small little church. He says, I know where it is. I said, will you take me there tomorrow on Saturday? So my brother was willing, reluctant, but uh, he was willing. And so before we got there, I said, Lord, please move upon my brother's heart. But oh God, please don't let anybody talk to me. Please don't let anybody talk to me because I'm afraid if you're going to have somebody talk to me, that means I'm going to have to be working here. And Lord, I want to go home. And so we walk into the church, my brother looking around. He always dresses very nicely, very polite. He looking, he's looking, people look kind of normal. Crowded, crowded. And we're sitting and I want to sit way, way the back so that nobody can see me and nobody looking at it. I'm not making any eye contact. I'm listening to the, with the corner of my eye, I'm watching the, uh, my brother, what reaction he has of somebody talking about the love of God and the Bible. So far, so good. The church was ended, and I said, sweetie, we've got to go, we've got to go. The driver was waiting for me. I asked him to wait at the front door. I'm out of here. So we're going, it's Kika, don't look, don't look because there is a gentleman coming facing you. Don't look. Finally, I couldn't, and I looked quite far away, and those deep black eyes looking at me, very handsome gentleman with a black bigot, and he's looking at me, and it's obvious that he wants to talk to me. I said, God, no, please. 
he came to me and he says, oh, I see that you are a visitor. Where are you from? And I'm in America and introduced my brother. He said, but you speak Ukrainian. I said, yes, I was born in Ukraine. My brother, of course, speaks perfect Ukrainian. He said, yes, we're from Ukraine. And he says, let me show you around. And he takes me around the church. He shows me that the children have their Sabbath school in a, in a cupboard sitting on the floor. The teacher cannot stand up straight. He took me to others. There they're playing with cold. The children playing all kinds of instruments with gloves on. The place crowded, people standing outside during church service. Everybody, and I, and I look how poor everything looks. It broke my heart. I, I remembered our beautiful church where we worship and these lovely people, faithful people, worshiping in such what, what I ended up calling a, a chicken coop. And that, that, I don't know the word in English, that, that it was like righteous indignation. I became indignant. How dare the country allow my fellow believers to be worshiping God in such uh, instruments, in such churches. And I look at the other churches with gold domes and beautifully decorated in and out. And the richness I saw uh, in, in the uh, uh, Orthodox churches, my brother took me there. He wanted me to see them. And so I looked at the gentleman and I said, well, why are you worshiping here? Why don't you have a better church? I've been trying for four years. I've been going to all the government stations. I have a whole file of things. I always go and they always say, no, the Protestants don't, uh, we don't have any room for Protestant churches. We don't have, no, we are rebuilding other things. We can only have money to rebuild other things. I said, who tells you that? Well, the uh, head, uh, 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 head architect of Ukraine, the architectural bureau, they said, uh, no, we cannot have that. I said, how do you get to the head architect? Oh, you have to put in a petition and uh, first talk to the uh, architect of uh, Kiev and then maybe go to the architect of Ukraine. I said, do you have his address? Yes. Could I get his phone number? He said, Kalina Aksanovna, you know, um, that, that might hurt the, uh, our church. I said, no, I, I just asked, do you have his phone number? He gave me the phone number. I got into my hotel. I got on my knees and I said, Lord, somehow I see that I'm going to be here longer than two weeks. God, I can do nothing. But I know you don't approve that our people are worshiping you, a God who created everything that has, ever has been created, for them to worship you in a chicken coop. I said, please, Lord, guide me. We have to do something about it. And a voice in my ear said, I was waiting for it. And so I said, Lord, your wisdom, not mine. And something says, Kika, call this number. I called this number, and through the operator, I said, I want to talk to the secretary of the uh, head direct, have, uh, chief architect of Ukraine. Who are you? I said, uh, my name is Kalida Bermele. I'm an American business person, and I would like to speak with him. What do you want to talk about it? I said, I am a business person, and I'm interested in the fact that a, I am a member of a denomination, the Seventh-day Adventists, and I was invited to go to the church, and I'm indignant in what kind of facilities my fellow believers are worshiping, and I would like to have an audience with the uh, chief architect and explain to him my indignation about it. I guess my voice was kind of... Strong, she says, uh, uh, okay, uh, let me just ask. She came back and says, can you be here on Tuesday at 10 o'clock in the morning? I said, I will be there at 10 o'clock in the morning. So I called brother, uh, his name is Brother Lesak, the gentleman with the brown eyes. He was a head elder and, and also the, later on the treasurer of our union. I said, uh, Brother Lesak, uh, we have an appointment at 10 o'clock. Oh, Kalina Alexander, no, Kalina Alexander, that's going to, spo you're sco going to spoil it. Uh, with time, I'm going to gain it. I I I'm going to get there. You know, there's certain procedures I have to follow. I said, Brother Lissac, but the Lord also has his procedures. If God leads 
and God led to the point that we have an appointment. Let's not even discombobulate God's plans. So he was reluctant. I said, just bring all the documents that show that you have tried everything. So he met me. We drove there. We arrived. The room filled with architects all trying to go inside. Apparently, that was a day that the uh, chief architect receives all architects when they have certain requests. So we are in the back, and uh, Brother Lissac positioned himself there that uh, we are going to stand here. The secretary is way in front behind her desk, and that maybe, possibly, when our name is going to be called after all the others, that we're going to go there. And I look at him, I said, Brother Lissac, we have to go and talk to the secretary. Oh, no, 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 she will call us. I said, Brother Lissac, it's 10 to 10, I have an appointment at 10. Oh, no, 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 they call. I said, excuse me. And I said in Ukrainian to the gentleman, I said, would you please excuse me? Would you excuse me? Would you excuse me? I had to go to the secretary, I have an appointment. After all, I'm an American, 10 o'clock means 10 o'clock. I arrived and the secretary says in, Ukraine, in, in Russian, Chtovam. Not, what, what do you want? And I said, ma'am, my name is Mrs. Kalida Bermele, in Ukrainian I said that. I am an American. I called, I made an appointment. I have an appointment at 10 o'clock. She looks, yes, but um, he is in conference with uh, several architects. I said, that's fine, I understand, but I have an appointment at 10 o'clock. I said, would you be kind enough and tell the gentleman I'm here? Oh, no, I cannot. I said, ma'am, you can because I have an appointment at 10 o'clock. And the other architects looking like, where did she come from? Said, we knew that Americans were abrasive. And I said, well, Kika, I was scared. But I said, I'm not going to wait until everybody's here. Maybe in the afternoon we'll get the audience. So the secretary looking at me, looking back, going through the door and saying, oh, the American is here. And I hear a very manly big voice saying, she is? Can she wait? And she said, no, she says she has appointment at 10 o'clock. And I hear him say, let her in. And he thought, boy, he's going to show me, how dare I? I walk in, and of course, only by the grace of God. And I have a tendency because I'm a woman, and I know I'm in a man's world. I put my shoulders back and pretend I own the place, scared to death, but didn't want anybody else to know I'm scared. I go all the way, he's sitting behind a desk that could have been a presidential desk. They love to have enormous desks. I'm sitting in front of him. Mr. Lissac, Brother Lissac is standing there. And he says, what do you want? And I said, sir, I understand you're chief architect for Ukraine. I visited with them on our holy day, Saturday. And uh, I must say, sir, that uh, I am indignant that a country like Ukraine and the land of my forefathers allows my fellow believers to worship their God in a place that I can only, sir, excuse me for saying it, worship in a chicken coop. And that, sir, you as a head architect, I'm sure do you, not want, you do not want to permit it to continue. He looked, what church is that? I said, the church of the, and then Brother Isaac said, Interrupted me, says, the Church of the Seventh-day Adventist. And he says, who? And he looks at the, his secretary who is standing by him. Well, what is that? And he says, Seventh-day Adventist. He says, well, why? He then turned around to Brother Lissac and says, well, why didn't you do it in the formal way? And by now, our brother got so powerful, he gained he really gained his power back and he raised his voice and he says, look, all these documents, on all these documents it says, not approved, not approved, not approved. I have tried here, I have tried here. He says, give it to me. And he looks, sure enough, he looks to his secretary and says, why was this always denied? And the secretary starts stumbling and, and stuttering rather. And then I said, well, you see, sir, it did not work the correct way, but I am here, sir to, as a business person, to commit to my fellow believers to build the first church, a Protestant church, 
in, well, well, we can build a church, but you know, like our church, you know how our church looks with the dome and so forth. I said, sir, I'm sorry, Protestant churches don't have uh, domes like the Protestant, the Orthodox Church has. They're very beautiful, but we don't have churches like that. They look different. And then I said, sir, have you ever seen a Protestant church? No Protestant churches here with, that are built. And I said, sir, would you mind if I invite you to my country so that you can see how the Protestant churches look? He said back, you invite me to America? I said, yes, sir. And I said, by the way, uh, our custom is when we invite an, an executive, we always invite his uh, uh, spouse to go with him too. He put his one foot on this table, he says, I have heard stories like this and I'm going to be invited to go. He says, I've heard that story from other people. Well, I had to travel with money. I happened to have $20,000 in $100 bills in my purse. You don't leave that in a hotel. So I said a silent prayer. I said, Lord, I don't want to show off, but I have to. So I said, God, be my, be my voice when I'm going to speak now. So I quietly picked up the, the pile of the dollar bills. I slammed it on the table and I said, Mr. Sonzo, I don't want to name his name, will this convince you that I can and will take you to Ukraine and your spouse if you permit me to? And the um, city, the chief architect of Kiev is sitting there too. And I knew he was a chief architect. And by the way, it, since I understand the chief architect of Kiev will be the one that would be designing our Protestant church, we will of course invite him so that he can see how the Protestant churches look. And of course we will invite his spouse too. He looks, he looked at the secretary, he says, you will? I said, sir, in about two hours, I will present you a letter, official letter from my corporation, officially inviting you to come to Ukraine and you, sir, too. Brother Lissak packed his things. We walked out and said, Karina Alexandrovna, you cannot do that. You, they have to have permission to leave. I said, Brother Lissak, I didn't do it. I was scared, but the Lord spoke through me. Did you see that he was receptive to it? I said, why would I not? I have the ability to do that and invite you. And by the way, Brother Lissak, I'm inviting you and your spouse. But you do one thing for me. I don't want it just to be a joyride. Please invite the biggest press that you know here. Invite the pressman and his cameraman to come. And if they have wives, invite them to come along with us too. And he said, you mean I can go and my wife too? I said, of course, I'll take you to Disneyland. So this is how the Lord led, Tracy, not because of our strength, but because if we listen to that small voice and do not put some damper between us and that voice, then God really fulfills that. Result, to make the story short, within two hours I had a letter on his desk, Brother Lissac brought it back to him, where I officially wrote that I invite him, his spouse, and the other gentleman to be by at, at soonest time that they can free themselves from their uh, uh, time schedule. And I immediately planned on that. Uh, Brother Lissac and his wife was invited. He got the press. I spoke to the pressman. I said, you're going to be busy, but you're going to go to America. And I said, I want you to take pictures of every Protestant church I will show you. And so he came along too. So the time comes to depart. Um, I met with the uh, gentleman one more time and, and he says uh, I had to have their passports and I look, his wife's passport was red. That means she, have, she was a higher official of the Communist Party and so were the other people there too. So I looked at it, he saw me looking and he says, yes, my wife was, had a high position in the Communist Party, so did I and I want you to know we are atheists. So we're only doing the church because that's our duty. And I said, I respect you, that's fine. I said, I will never uh, insist that you believe in my faith as long as we become equal and you don't insist for me to become atheist. So God led us to New York and 
there I already had everything arranged, transportation for our entire group. The next morning we go and I only see the people looking up. The architect, Brother Lysak, both architects, amazing at the buildings in New York. They said, this is just like, like an, another, another planet. And so I said, we could have breakfast, but go ahead and look around. Please bear in mind, Tracy, at that time in Ukraine, when I arrived, there was no food in stores, no food. And at one point I was hungry for a little bit something different. So I saw on the street, a lady was selling bananas and a little, her son was there and she wanted to get banana and she said to him, I don't have the money. So I bought the bananas, the lady was selling eggs. I have nothing. I said, could you put in a little bag? I'm buying a dozen of eggs, which she had no bag on. So I had to put it into my purse and I'm walking in Kiev to my hotel with a bag with a dozen of eggs. I say, Lord, please don't let them bust because all my documents are there. So I'm just trying to tell you what hunger there was. And now we are in New York. And this lady, the wife of the head architect, she went a little bit further ahead and I heard a dreadful crying, a lady crying. And I was with other people busy. And I said, what happened? And they said, the wife of the head architect, she went into a Jewish delicatessen store and is filled with food that she could only imagine in a dream to see from bottom to top the greatest del delicacies. And when she saw that, I hear her cry. I put my arms around it. I didn't know why she's crying. I said, Lord, why are you crying? Did I do something? Did somebody offend you? All she could see while she was embracing, crying on my shoulder, says, Colleen Alexandrovna, they were lying to me. And I walk in here and I don't know where to look with all the food. So this is what happened to these poor people in high position, how they were introduced to America. So she became common. Bottom line is, I took them through New York, showed them New York. I took them to the general conference. We met the president of the general conference. We took them to hospitals uh, in, in New York. We took them to uh, Orlando. Um, we took them to, uh, finally, to, uh, to the uh, Disneyland, to the church, Markham Woods Church. And I believe I mentioned to you before, my only prayer was that when we take them to a service during that time, both architects taking pictures of the churches and designing the churches. Oh, they, they, they're so ecstatic that these churches are enormous, but they don't look like the, the, uh, the Orthodox churches. And so I asked them if they would come to this service with me at uh, Markham Woods Church. And I was very surprised, all of this, yes, yes. So I said to Mickey, I said, Mickey, you know, I just pray that the pastor is not going to talk about Daniel 7 and all the beasts and Revelation, all of which are extremely important. But I pray that somehow he will say a sermon that will touch people's lives. So my wonderful group came in. They sat down in Winnipeg. I'm translating, still praying about the sermon. And Brother Coffin, bless his heart. He started the wonderful sermon of love of a father who lost his son, but the son found the way, and how the father did not wait for the son to come and bow before him and ask for forgiveness. The father ran towards him when he saw him with almost blind eyes. My lost son has come home. And when I translated it, these hardcore communist who told me and laughed about it and said that religion is nothing but uh, opium of the people. I looked at the chief architect, big, strong man, and I could not believe my eyes. Tears running down his face, his wife wi wiping her eyes. There was not a dry eye among the group. Even the cameraman who was taking pictures, who told me that he is an atheist, found that sermon that there is somebody, there is a father they don't know about. 
that does accept a lost son that comes and embraces him no matter what the son has done before. So that was my introduction into Ukraine. When we came back, well, before we're traveling, I must also mention how God works. In the front sits the head uh, architect. In the back, I sit next to the head architect of Kiev, who was in charge, made in charge to now design our first Adventist church in Kiev. And he has a big pad, and he's designing, and the land next to it. Suddenly, I hear the chief architect of Ukraine and says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm designing that. Davai, give it to me. The Davai means the favorite word, give it. So the architect showed it. Uh, how much land are you giving? No, 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 no. Give them here more. They need more. Here, give it the upper part. Oh, we can give them this too. And all of a sudden, I'm just praying. I said, Lord, not Santa Claus, but you are here giving our church land. By the time we were through, we had led to build in the center of Kiev a beautiful first Adventist church that was dedicated to, to the Lord. And all that only because I was influenced to say, take them to America, let them take a look what Protestant churches look, look like. So that is was beginning of my activity in Ukraine. Meanwhile, I said goodbye to my brother. I said, Svito, forgive me, but um, I think I'm going to stay a little bit longer. I stayed there for seven months. I had all my wardrobe sewn because I had nothing else and I couldn't buy anything else. And I saw there was so much work to be done. And I said, Brother, well, where is the money for it? I said, Brother Isaac, if God permitted us to have the land, God is going to find the money for it. And I said, let's drill down. I said, Brother Isaac, it has been my experience to decide, do we believe in a small God? Or do we believe in a large God? And he says, Khalid looks out of the large God. I said, okay, if we believe in a large God, let's kneel down and let the large God find the finances for the church. Because I am not a wealthy person. God has been very good to me, but I certainly would not have enough finances to do what God led me to do in Ukraine. So I said, well, I started asking, is there anything in Ukraine that's not kneeled down, nailed down, so that I can sell it? So meanwhile, it became known to the um, banking people that here's an America who is a banker and a finance person in finance. And so I get calls. I get calls from senators. Uh, asking me how Ukraine can improve their uh, financial situation. I get a call from a president of, uh, Mr. President, he was at that time president of the Bank of Ukraine, Mr. Yushchenko. He invited me to come to uh, his uh, uh, bank on a Sunday when there was nobody there. And I arrived with my driver and I think that's funny. There's no cars here. Usually there are a lot of cars looking for audience. I walked into the bank and there was only another gentleman standing there. And I said, Mr. Yushchenko, I am here, but what can I do for you? And he says, um, also a very tall, very good looking gentleman. He became president of Ukraine later. He says, Kalina Alexandrovna, we need to make out a bank guarantee for $100, 000, $100 million. And you know, we never had to do that before because all this was issued in Kremlin. We would just receive, we would, uh, receive the funds that we would need here, and I now need to issue out the bank guarantee. So I said, that's not a problem. Do you have a computer? Uh, well, um, no, we don't have a computer. I said, that's no problem. Do you have a typewriter? Oh, yes. They bring me a typewriter in Cyrillic. I do write in Cyrillic, but I said, Mr. Yushchenko, I'm sorry, but um, if you're going to get the money from London, then you really need to have it in the English language and not in Cyrillic. Well, we don't have a typewriter in Cyrillic. I said, okay, not a problem. Do you have a yellow pad? Do you have a pad? Ah, oh, we have the pad. I said, okay. I took out my pen and I wrote out the bank guarantee for Ukraine to borrow 100 million from a bank in London for Ukraine development. 
There's a sad story behind that, though, unfortunately. So as a result of that, I know it became known that there is a funny lady, this American, that talks so loud, and she is in finance. So maybe that's of interest to us. So then, since the senator started calling me, I told them, I said, you know, uh, I'm sure that you have things in Ukraine here that I jokingly said is not nailed down. We can sell it and we can take that money and with that money we can multiply it and do whatever you need to develop Ukraine. They said, well, what do we have? I said, what do you have? They said, well, we have steel. Oh, steel, no problem. I never heard about steel. Still no problem. So I picked up the phone. I happened to have, because I had clients in Germany also because of my work. I had my company, finance company. So I called my associates in uh, Germany and he made a contact with a steel buyer. The steel buyer calls me immediately. He said, Mrs. Frau Bermele, I buy anything they have to sell. I said, can I bring my colleagues? They'll buy it too. I said, be my guest. So here they arrived. We have a contract, we're selling steel. I said, what else do you have to sell? Aluminum, aluminum, no problem. I knew somebody in Holland, I called Holland. They said, oh, we'll buy aluminum anytime. All right, so we're doing that. On the, all of that, we are, of course, earning money. God is providing what we needed in order not only to do that, but when I looked around, I became ill. And one of the doctors, of our Seventh-day Adventist came to see me and he told me that it's very difficult to go to the clinic. There's only one clinic that was used by the hierarchy, communist hierarchy, and they're the only ones that could go to that clinic. But I spoke with them and they said, because you're an American, they will treat you also. I said, well, is there a doctor that would come to see me? And he says, well, uh, yes, there is a uh, brother of ours, but he's in another city. Uh, he would, I said, would you be kind of to have him come and see me? I really did not want to necessarily go to where I was being invited to go. And so here comes a doctor, frayed, nicely iron suit, frayed cuffs, things. And I, he looked at me and I say, uh, what should I pay you? Oh, no, no, Kalidoksandrovna. No. I said, sir, you came all the way. So I gave him $100. He started crying. He says, no, no, that's, that's too much. That's my one month wages. I said, brother, not my money. I didn't give you mine. It all belongs to God anyway. And God says for me to take, give it to you. So you have no right to say no. So we kind of had a little joke about it. And so I said, wait a minute, medicine, our doctors here, they're in dire need of medicine. So I met a young doctor, Dr. David Noga. I said, David, we must be doing something for Adventists. We are known all the world over about our medicine. We have to do something about it. And he says, Colleen Alexander, we have no money. I said, I don't have any, but God does. Let's do something in medicine. I'm going to end the story very shortly. We decided to form a medical association, 500 doctors and dentists in a medical association. I said, David, his name is David Noga. David, I don't find one Ukrainian uh, magazine that speaks of health. I can see that people's main food here is salo. That's a fat, pig's fat. That's their main diet. We must have a magazine to, to publish to tell people about health. We organized a, medi a uh, only, only medical journal that the public, for the public published in that. Uh, after the health minister with whom I met saw the magazine, he ordered that it be available at all post offices so that when people go to the post office, they can at the same time order that magazine. And the doctors, our 500 doctors, were the contributors under the leadership of Dr. David Noga of the articles in I have all the magazines. Beautiful magazine, much nicer than anything. And by the way, I didn't make it beautiful. They did. Um, more beautiful than any other magazine you can find in, in Ukraine. It was in a Russian language, not to my liking, but I was told since more people speak Russian than Ukrainian, uh, it's better to make it in uh, Russian, so against my 
uh, wishes, but with my approval, it was done in in uh, res. So we had to take care of medical exp uh, to make the medical work grow. So we sold crude oil, we sold aluminum, we sold chicken halal to people in Holland who only eat uh, Muslim eat halal. We uh, we sold jewelry, we sold diamonds, anything that we could possibly get our hands on. And now we talk to come to education. Brother, uh, Dr. David Nogas, uh, uh, brother-in-law, is an educator. Dr. Anatoly Zhilovaha, a fantastic gentleman, a tall, very, very good-looking Ukrainian gentleman. And I was invited to their humble home. And when I say humble, I mean very humble. And yet the table was decked completely. And I was sitting next to Dr. Zhilovaha. By that time we were, I was Kalina Alexandrovna, he was Anatoly. I said, Anatoly, we have to have a school. He says, well, that's what I was talking to you. That's why I asked to name David if I can sit next to you. I said, well, what can we do? He says, well, you know what? I saw a building and I think that building would be ideal for us. I said, let's go. So after Sabbath, the next day, he picked me up and we go onto a certain area and there are several buildings in there and one very large building. But it was all kind of downtrodden and not totally dilapidated, but really it looked like it needed some loving, tender care. We walk into these big, large doors and there is a mural as large as your wall all the way to your ceiling. And in that mural, one young man standing with a sickle in his hand. On the other side, a blonde, healthy-looking girl with a hammer in her hand. And above it says, Komsomolci. That was the name for the uh, youth, the communist youth. And I looked at Anatoly, and Anatoly at me. And I said, Anatoly, can you imagine that only God can make such a strange circumstance where we are standing in this hall. There was a hall where they educated young people to go throughout the world to spread communism. And you are going to form in this hall a school where young people are going to go throughout the world teaching people and save their souls. And it was such a moving moment for me that I said, oh Lord, I don't have any money. And a whisper said, well, there's still some things to sell. And so we walked out there, and that is how it started. The Bucha school that uh, was repaired. Uh, a few days later, I was sitting with Anatoly. I saw tears in his eyes. He says, Kelly Alexander, we're starting school. It's supposed to start. We already have, I don't know, 50 or something students, and we have no uh, school desks. I said, do you know anybody who sells them? Yes, I already know, but I need $6,000. I said, not a problem, God has money. I took it out of the purse, gave it to him. Next day he called Khalid Sadumna. the students are going to be boarding and we have no cupboards to hang their clothes. They'll have to hang their clothes over the metal bar of their beds. I said, God has money, was bought, was paid, and went on and on, whether the building of the sanctuary there, the road needed uh, paving. Girls were walking around in their pretty little high heels and mud. And I said, Anatoly, that cannot go like this. Find out how much it's going to cost. He says, but we don't have the money. I said, I don't have any either. God has the money. I said, do you remember what I told you before? Do we believe in tiny God or in a big God? He said, oh, no, no, big God. I said, good. First graduation comes, and he says, you know, Kalina Alexandrovna, in um, Ukraine, nobody graduated with garbs on. And I know I bought, was in America, and they have those beautiful graduation gowns on. And I was so much appreciative we could do that, but I don't have any money. I said, Anatoly, do you have any ladies here that so? I would assume so. He said, oh, yes, we have ladies that sew. I said, go, get the material, here's the money, let them sew the uh, graduation garbs. 
I understand from the people yesterday in the Sabbath school, they still use those garbs. But the moving thing for me was that this wonderful, he has a PhD, he is a very educated gentleman. I arrived in Ukraine for my next trip, and he says, Kali, look, I want to show you something, I want to show you something. I arrived there for the graduation. He goes into the car, opens up the trunk, takes out his graduation garb. Look, he says, look, how, he says in Ukrainian, yak shikarno, how beautiful. And he modeled his head, and it touched my heart so much. I said, do we value that like that here? And then, I didn't tell him, but I will tell you a secret. I never wore a graduation garb. My sons graduated. And when my first son graduated from Mount Vernon Academy, actually then Blue Mountain Academy and Mickey, I asked him if they would allow me to put the cap on my head. And I looked and I smiled at the advice, kids, I graduated. I didn't graduate, I don't have a piece of paper to show it. But in God's heaven, I think there is a graduation certificate that God gave me, not graduating from school, but graduating from his school, because he taught me that he is love. And so I'm sorry that I need to take a deep breath. But at this point, I think that probably was one of the most painful in my heart, that I was somehow robbed the opportunity to have a formal education. By the way, I don't miss it because God taught me the, um, I, I graduated from a degree with love of life. But somehow, when I saw it so joyfully, my family, my children graduate. And just four weeks ago, my daughter adopted a young lady in Ukraine. I helped her to adopt a young girl from an orphanage. She just graduated from an Adventist Academy in Michigan. And here I saw this little orphan girl in a beautiful garb. I have her picture graduating from our academy. And all I could say to God, God, it doesn't matter. No, I never wore a garb. I never had a garb where somebody puts a little thing from left side to right side or the other way around. But all my children and my grandchildren did. And that's enough for me. So I'm only mentioning it because there's certain things in life that were denied, but that doesn't matter. Because the things that were not denied, the things that God showers on us, really makes up for that. God has made up so many things for me with a wonderful, healthy family. I often tell them, I pray morning and night religiously to keep them. And I said to my children, you know, kids, I almost have a feeling that somehow in Ukraine you say that you are under God's wing uh, uh, armpit. And I said, you know, I almost have a feeling that God put the fam our family under his armpit because none of us have anything that we could say that is with that we cannot bear. And so I can honestly say that the loss that I have had was a gain because God showed me that all these things in a few years I'm going to exchange for a crown that he promised those that are faithful. And that's all I want. My entire family and everyone that I can meet that God allowed me to be instrumental to tell them about the love of God, that I will see that they're also.